Did you ever imagine that one day there'd be a fully electric Vauxhall Astra? Well, here it is. This EV shares all its engineering with its close cousin, the Peugeot E308, and like that fellow Stellantis Group model, is available in hatch and sports tour estate form, with smart looks, but quite ambitious asking prices. Vauxhall aims to be an EV only manufacturer by 2028, so it needs to get on with delivering us more full battery models, like this one, the Astra Electric. Today, Vauxhall finds itself in something of a dilemma. With the latest range of Griffin badged models, Mark owner, the Stellantis Group, has instructed the brand to push up prices, aim at private customers, and switch away from the low margin fleet sales that have sustained this manufacturer for the last few decades. Yet here, it brings its first all electric family hatchback, the Astra Electric, into an EV market, 70% of which is dominated by registrations made to fleets and businesses. How these people will feel about rather plump pricing, which from the mid-2023 launch pitched this car in the 38 to 45,000 pound bracket will be interesting to see. There's certainly no sign of pricing for electric vehicles getting anywhere near the figures being asked for their combustion powered counterparts. As with its identically engineered Stellantis Group cousin, the Peugeot E308, the Astra Electric, available either in this hatch or in sports Tora estate forms, joins an L-series range that offers three different combustion alternatives. A conventional 1.2-litre unit, a 1.2-litre hybrid and a 1.6-litre plug-in hybrid. No shortage of choice then. So why would you pay the extra for this full EV model? Well, you're gonna need the industry's most comprehensive review, the car and driving road test to find out. Somehow, we don't expect a humble Astra to be fully electric. But of course, this L-series model is now anything but humble. It's price certainly isn't. Nor is the modern screen fest that greets you when you get behind the wheel. Unlike some EV rivals, this isn't one of those electric vehicles that senses your presence immediately you take your seat. So it's necessary to locate the silver start button hidden behind the left hand column stalk. At which point the monitors light up and a green ready message in the instrument display indicates this electric Astra's readiness to get going. But readiness for what? We wondered what we might get here. A smaller Corsa electric hatch does after all feel rather dynamically compromised over the equivalent combustion version. Fortunately, that's far less of an issue in this case, helped by the fact that the Vauxhall Opel designers, aided by the relatively light EMP2 V3 platform, have managed to keep weight in check. This EV Astra actually only weighs 68 kilograms more than the plug-in hybrid version. Mind you, that still means a gross weight of 2,100 kilograms, which doesn't help the car's slightly over firm ride over POC marked surfaces. It's nothing you couldn't live with though, and it's probably better than what you'd get from the Renault Megane E-Tech competing model that this Vauxhall wants to rival as the class agility champion. If you want some competitor notes, then we'll tell you that a Volkswagen ID3 would feel a touch more comfortable in suburbia. That Renault might be a fraction more fun to drive on your back route home, but this Astra is arguably the best compromise option between the three cars. But of course, there are many more than three cars these days in this overcrowded EV segment, or at least there are provided you include crossovers and SUVs amongst this Vauxhall's direct rivals, as indeed you should. If not, then the only real alternative to an Astra Electric is the Stellantis Group cousin model. It shares almost all its engineering with the Peugeot E308. 
As with that car, you get a 54 kilowatt hour battery pack powering a front mounted 152 brake horsepower electric motor, putting out a healthy 270 newton meters of torque. This kind of output ought to be enough for a car of this size, but because of that plump curb weight, the initially rapid start off punch tails off pretty rapidly. The 62 mile an hour benchmark finally reached in just 9.2 seconds on the way to a modest top speed of 105 miles an hour. Through the corners, you'll feel the extra weight of that big battery. But as usual, in an EV, its central low down positioning minimizes the downside by lowering the center of gravity. There are no steering wheel paddles to alter brake regeneration, but Vauxhall does provide a transmission B setting, which provides some of that. And there are three driving modes, sport, normal, and eco, with the non-sport settings delivering a little less power in order to preserve driving range, which is quoted at between 252 and 260 miles, which isn't especially noteworthy by current standards. With that in mind, you won't feel especially encouraged to start pushing the car or throwing it about, though Vauxhall claims it's been designed in a way that you could, thanks to suspension changes and decently precise steering. On top of that, the battery installation has apparently boosted torsional rigidity by 31%, though there's more body lean through the bends than that statistic would lead you to expect. And something of a nose-led balance suggesting that all the electric motor gubbins that have replaced the usual engine beneath the bonnet don't save this car a great deal in terms of weight. As with other Astras, this car gets a dose of the latest Stellantis Group self-driving tech, or at least it does on an upper spec model like this one anyway. Specifically, a drive assist 2.0 system that helps with lane changes, controls your speed in bends, and as you approach junctions and roundabouts, recommends speed adaption in advance. The rival Peugeot E308 does of course use exactly the same system, but as we've been saying, this Astra Electric has a slightly different, feistier character, suggesting that Stellantis is allowing Vauxhall and Opel models to retain some degree of different identity beyond mere exterior packaging. This Astra will need that for the future if it's to be desired rather than discounted. This tailgate e-badge is the only external giveaway that you're looking at an all-electric version of this L-Series Astra. Plus, of course, the lack of a tailpipe. Otherwise, there are no visual clues at all, unless you bend down and look really closely, in which case you might see the 54 kilowatt hour battery pack bringing the underside of the car a fraction closer to the ground. Like the other available electrified Astras, the hybrid and the plug-in hybrid, this one comes in a choice of two body styles, either this five-door hatch or the usual sports Tora estate. Of course, if you're able to look beneath the sharply creased clamshell bonnet, it's all very different indeed, though it's a touch disappointing that there's any sort of powertrain underneath here at all, given that some notable rivals use this area to offer extra luggage space, or at least a convenient place for your charging leads. As with other Astras and all current Vauxhalls, the nose is set apart by this so-called Vauxhall visor, the narrow black grille plate that flows across into equally narrow ultra-slim LED headlamps, which with this top variant gain the brand's Intellilux pixel technology. Unlike with the combustion model, base trim comes with these corner cutout panels below the headlights. It's a bit less distinctive from the side, the profile view marked by the pronounced forward rake of this C-pillar. In the interests of controlling consumption, you might expect an EV model to have smaller wheels than its engine equivalent. Actually, the opposite is true here. All Astra electrics have the large diamond cut 18 inch alloy rims that with a combustion Astra, you'd have to stretch to the very priciest trim level to get. If you avoid entry level trim, you'll get this contrast colored roof, which gets rather lost with dark paint shades. A nod to more recent Astras is this 
tick-shaped lower blade line crease flowing up from the sills towards the rear. The Sports Tourer Estate version, unlike some family hatch-based station wagons, is actually usefully longer than this standard body style, increasing this Astra hatch's 4,374 millimetres length by a further 268 millimetres. As usual though, what's more important is what lies beneath this angular panel work, namely the current V3 version of the Stellantis Group's EMP2 platform, 50% of the parts for which needed to be re-engineered to accommodate this EV powertrain. Which means that everything you can't see here is shared with two similarly sized Stellantis Group models, the DS4 and more notably the Peugeot 308. Outside Vauxhall and its German Opel partner brand have done a good job of giving the Astra its own identity despite that. So, will the same be true in the cabin? There are no changes inside to distinguish this full battery model, apart from the expected EV differences on the 10-inch instrument and infotainment screens. Look carefully at the instrument display and you'll note a power eco charge meter to the left and a battery capacity readout on the right. The differences with this centre screen are harder to spot, mostly concerned with an added energy section, which gives you an energy flow monitor, consumption statistics and a charging section. This infotainment monitor even provides games like Hangman 2048 and Tic Tac Toe that you can play while you're waiting for the car to charge if you're stuck in it at a public charging point. Otherwise, it's just as in any other Astra, electrified or otherwise. The Vauxhall Opel designers seem clearly to have been told that they had to keep all the basic cabin architecture and screen tech of the third generation Peugeot 308, yet at the same time, do something different with it. And the result of this unenviable brief is that the angular, interesting dash of this car's French cousin has been swapped out for a rather more austere, slab-sided look based around the twin 10-inch display pure panel arrangement we just mentioned, which is seamlessly integrated with glass edge-to-edge -edge design. Still, there are some interesting touches. The diagonal fascia slash in front of the passenger is jaunty and this driver's side vent with its vertical slashes is certainly unusual. Plus you may well prefer this conventional steering wheel and instrument binnacle arrangement over the alternative Peugeot E308's curious eye cockpit design which sees you peering at a tiny dial cluster over the top of the lower set wheel rim. As with the combustion variants, you're going to need to be a fan of shiny, dark piano black plastic to light this cabin, surfacing which, as usual with this finish, constantly picks up hairs and dust. But as long as you are, the whole effect is agreeably futuristic. With scattered premium touches like the silver start-stop button, the stitched steering wheel, proper coverings for the stowage areas, and this Mercedes-style twin lidded box between the seats. But there's no getting away from all the screen tech. The base version has Vauxhall's pure panel screen setup, where the display surrounds are finished in high gloss black. Above that level in the range, your Astra Electric will have this more sophisticated looking pure panel pro arrangement, where the screen surrounds are fully glazed. We told you earlier that this central infotainment color touchscreen was 10 inches in size, but the actual display function area you have to work with is much narrower than that because it's always flanked on either side by broad temperature readouts which don't actually allow you to adjust the temperature but instead connect you through to a separate climate screen with options to do so. Still, at least there's a decent selection of shortcut climate buttons in the middle of the center stack so you don't have to keep finding that climate menu every time you want to alter temperature or fan speed. And there's also a proper rotary volume control too. The display graphics are clear and everything you really need is incorporated, including navigation, plus wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring. This infotainment package also features a DAB audio system with six speakers, some useful drive assist tutorial videos, and natural Hey Vauxhall voice recognition as well. 
The digital instrument cluster screen, as I said earlier, is also 10 inches in size and far deeper than the letterbox shaped display you get on an E308, which allows it to be properly configurable. Something that unusually happens by clicking on the end of the left hand column stalk rather than on a steering wheel button. That makes it easier to do without taking your eyes off the road. There are energy flow, trip data, drive assist and minimalistic layout formats, some of which do look slightly cluttered, none of which give you round gauges and all of which are flanked by the strange vertical meters we referenced earlier. Clicking on the end of the right hand column stalk allows you to scroll through various centrally displayed trip computer readouts. Throughout the digital speedo with its flanking transmission mode and gear selection display stays constant. Our favourite part of the front of cabin experience actually has nothing to do with screens and everything to do with seats. You sit lower down than in this model's crossover class rivals, which makes it all feel a bit sportier. And provided you avoid base trim, the driver's seat and with top trim both front seats will be of the sports style ergonomic active kind, which means it gets electric tilt and electro pneumatic lumbar support and that the chair's posture has been designed for certification approval from the German Action Gesunde Rücken EV organisation, who campaign across Europe for aids to healthier backs. As a result, this is one of the most comfortable perches you can have in the EV C segment, the sort of thing that conceivably might really sell you this car. What else? Well, build quality seems strong. Once a product of Ellesmere Port near Liverpool, all Astras these days are screwed together at Russelsheim in Germany. But it's all a bit dark and sombre, and we do have some reservations regarding material quality. You don't get the feeling that this cabin's going to be particularly hard wearing. Rather cheap feeling rubber scrolling covers are provided over the cup holders and across the storage area at the bottom of the centre stack. On this test car, as on others that we've tried, they're already discolouring. Despite the absence of an instrument binnacle hood, which allows for the fitment of a head-up display on top models, upward reflections onto the windscreen have been avoided by incorporating a shutter-like upper layer onto the pure panel screen layer, but the designers haven't been able to avoid these two screens attracting their own unwanted reflections. We touched on storage earlier, that's pretty well provided for. The glove box and door pockets are deep, as is this bin at the base of the centre stack, which can accommodate a wireless phone charger and has twin USB-C ports and a 12 volt socket just above that. We mentioned the lidded cup holders and the twin lidded box between the seats, which is also deep. You also get a phone cubby behind the handbrake switch, ticket clips in the sun visors, and there's a neat narrow cubby with a pop-out lid in the centre of the dash for your sunglasses. Front three-quarter vision can be slightly impeded at junctions by the way that these A pillars slope, and your over-the-shoulder view is slightly obscured by thick rear pillars, so you're going to need the standard all-round parking sensors. OK, time to take a look in the rear, and the door opening isn't that big. And once inside, it doesn't feel at all EV-like. Electric vehicles that use platforms only designed for electric vehicles almost always have palatial levels of rear seat leg space. Those EVs that sit on platforms also designed for combustion power don't, and this is one of those. Vauxhall claims that there's 680 millimetres of leg room, 10 millimetres more than in the Peugeot E308, but it still feels a touch more cramped than the class norm. Headroom isn't particularly generous either, particularly on variants with this large glass roof fitted. And the headrests are of the sort that dig uncomfortably into your shoulders until they're raised. Plus the provision of the kind of prominent centre transmission tunnel you'd think an EV wouldn't need won't help if you've to try and carry a third central passenger. When there's only two of you, if you've avoided base trim, you'll have this armrest, which has the usual integrated cup holders and also a little pen tray. And though overhead coat hooks have been omitted, there's pretty much everything else you could need, like twin central vents, below which is a cubby and a USB-C port. You also get seat back pockets, reasonably sized door bins, 
and beady little overhead reading lights. Finally, let's take a look out back. Now you raise the rear hatch by pressing on this central Griffin emblem. Using a composite material for this tailgate doesn't seem to have made it that much lighter and there's no powered option. But once everything's raised, well, unlike with the smaller Corsa Electric, which matches the boot capacity of its combustion counterpart, this EV Astra's trunk is just as compromised as it is in plug-in hybrid form. The usual combustion Astra, 422 litre total, falling to 352 here because of the battery below the cargo area floor. Nor do you get that combustion model's useful adjustable height floor and there's a reduction in space beneath the cargo base, just this small lower compartment, which isn't even really big enough to store the charging leads in, hence this bag. As usual with an Astra, a 12 volt socket has been omitted, but there are a couple of bag hooks, the usual tie down points and a light on the left hand side. And the whole area is of a good square size, which will swallow up to five carry on suitcases. With the Sports Tourer estate version, there's a 548 litre boot down from 608 litres normally, and there's 600 millimetres of load height. If you need space for longer items, you'll need to avoid base trim on this hatch because that doesn't have the central ski hatch that does feature here. Or choose the Sports Tour at a stage, which has a backrest featuring a more convenient 40-20-40 split. With the back seat folded, an Astra electric hatch will offer you 1,268 litres of capacity. For the Astra electric Sports Tour at a state, the seat's folded figure is 1,553 litres. Again, these are the same figures you get with the equivalent plug-in hybrid version. As we filmed in early 2024, asking prices were starting from around 38,000 for this Astra Electric in hatch form with base design trim. You'll need around 40,000 pounds for mid-range GS trim and just over 43,000 for the plusher ultimate spec that we've got here. There's quite a premium, 2,200 pounds for the alternative Sports Tora Estate body style. For one of those, as we filmed, prices started from around 40,000 pounds. This car's Peugeot E308 close cousin doesn't come with a base level of trim, but if you compared it with mid and top level Astra electric spec, you'd find that it would cost almost exactly the same. Not that many customers will be buying this car outright. The finance deals they're more likely to want to consider look a lot more appealing. At the time of this test, with a typical deposit over a five year term, you would have been looking at paying from around £400 a month to run an Astra Electric, around £100 more than the equivalent combustion version. If your point of comparison is with an Astra plug-in hybrid, that difference would narrow considerably, given that the PHEV variant comes within around £2,000 of an equivalent EV model's asking price. Arguably, a better Astra option than both would be the Astra Hybrid E DCT6. You can't plug it in, but it'll run for much of your town travel on its battery, and it'll save you around £8,000 over this EV Astra in terms of upfront asking price. It's difficult to get past that asking price, isn't it? After all, this car's most obvious segment rivals, compact EVs like Volkswagen's ID3, Renault's Megane E-Tech Electric, Kia's Nero EV, the Cupra Born, and Hyundai's Kona Electric are all priced significantly lower in the 35 to 37,000 pound bracket as we filmed. Money that at the time of this test would also have purchased you the entry level sport version of the considerably larger Fisker Ocean. And if you really want to save some cash on an EV of this sort, then at the time of filming, around £30,000 would get you a very acceptable MG4 EV long range, which would also take you much further on each charge. You might additionally want to look at the Fiat 600e and the Volvo EX30. They're both around £34,000. And consider the fact that mid-range Astra electric money would also get you a Mini Countryman Electric or a Nissan Aria. It all means that you're going to have to really want this Astra's more conventional hatch and estate body shapes and 
think that this Vauxhall has a more stylish, sporty feel than cars like those. There's just a chance you might, and if so, you're going to need to know about equipment levels. Now, as you'd hope for the sums being asked, even base design spec is relatively well equipped. Specifically, you get 18 inch diamond cut alloy wheels, full LED headlamps, LED front fog lights, LED tail lights, auto headlamps and wipers, an acoustic windscreen, front and rear parking sensors, a Thatcham category one approved alarm, and a very comprehensive level of camera safety kit which we'll cover off for you in a moment. Drive stuff includes adaptive cruise control with intelligent speed adaptation, and you get eco, normal, and sport driving modes as well. Inside, with a design spec Astra electric variant, there's electronic climate control, a six-way adjustable driver's seat, and a 10-inch digital instrument cluster. Media connectivity is taken care of by the other 10-inch screen that makes up this cabin's pure panel package. This one, the central infotainment monitor, which incorporates a navigation system along with voice recognition, a six speaker DAB audio system, Bluetooth and wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring. You can also interact with your Astro when you're away from it, thanks to the My Vauxhall Vauxhall Connect app. Via this, you can see essential data like energy consumption and remaining range. Plus, you can precondition cabin temperature, make servicing appointments and access a digital handbook. The next step up in the Astra electric range lies with the sportier looking GS trim level. It'll probably be most people's starting point in the range because the menacing styling of this L-series Astra model needs the contrast-coloured roof, the sport-style bumpers, the dark-tinted rear windows and the dark finish for the Griffin badge and Vauxhall visor front grille, all of which is standard from mid-level trim upwards. The blacked-out 18-inch wheels give the Astra a darker vibe at this level, though you may think they look a little max power. The other reason you might want to stretch at least to mid-level for your Astra Electric is that there's quite a step up in quality cabin ambience if you do so. The base model's pure panel screen layout is replaced by a more sophisticated looking pure panel pro arrangements where the screen surrounds are fully glazed. Also at this level in the range, you get ambient lighting, alloy effect pedals, Keyless entry, a heated steering wheel, a black headliner, frameless rear view mirror, a rear ski hatch, dual zone electronic climate control, and an Intellivision 360 degree panoramic parking camera. But more important than any of that though is the addition of a much more comfortable driver's seat of the sports style ergonomic active kind, which means it gets electric tilt and electro pneumatic lumbar support and that the chair's posture has been designed for certification approval from the German Action Gesunde Rücken EV organization, who campaign across Europe for aids to healthier backs. We're not sure that we'd find the extra to stretch to the plusher ultimate trim level we have here, but you might if you like the idea of cutting edge technology, because you'll need to be at this level in the range to get a feature that Vauxhall reckons makes this Astra really stand out in its segment, IntelliLux LED pixel light headlights. Now with this, each ultra slim headlamp unit features no fewer than 84 LEDs, which activate individually according to the driving situation and your surroundings, cutting out glare for other road users and better illuminating your way around corners and on minor roads. Further tech additions at this level include a head up display and a wireless phone charger. Plus, the front passenger seat gains the sports style ergonomic active design I just mentioned. There's Alcantara upholstery and an Intelli Air air quality sensor. You also get a big panoramic glass sunroof. Across the range, you'll almost certainly be paying your Vauxhall dealer extra for paint colour because the only standard shade is Arctic White. Here, we've got quite striking tri coat cobalt blue. Unlike with some more conventional Astras, there's no opportunity to add in provision for a spare wheel, but you can specify a tow bar, though with that in use, we're not quite sure 
what that would do to your likely driving range. Probably nothing good. On to safety equipment, which is the same as with any other Astra. Now, as you'd expect, all variants get autonomous braking. Vauxhall's forward collision alert system, though it only works to alert you of errant vehicles and pedestrians, unfortunately, unlike the cleverer current systems, it's not smart enough to specifically pick out bicycles, motorcycles or animals. That's fair enough, perhaps, given the class of car this is, but it's a bit mean on the part of Vauxhall to only make the system work above low speeds if you avoid entry-level trim. Penny pinching like this with luxury features is fair enough, but it shouldn't be permitted with key safety systems like automatic braking. The base version does without speed limit recognition as well. We've no real issues otherwise in this area, given that this Astra features most of the basic camera safety items you'd now expect from an EV family hatchback or crossover in this day and age. So, Lane departure warning with lane keeping assist is standardised across the lineup, and if your Astra Electric is fitted with the aforementioned speed limit recognition system, then that setup will stop you exceeding posted limits. There's also in crash braking, which will brake the car after an impact so that you're less likely to go on and hit something else. You also get driver attention alert to warn you if drowsiness is detected and a forward collision alert feature that gives you close obstacle detection that stops you hitting things at low speeds and also at higher ones if you avoid base trim. Also standard across the range is high beam assist to automatically dip your headlights for you at night and an SOS safety system which will alert the emergency services with your GPS location if the airbags go off. There are eight of those, by the way. Of course, across the lineup, all the other usual passive safety features come included. Twin Isofix child seat fittings for the rear seat, front seat safety headrests, hill start assist, ESP stability control, and ABS with automatic hazard light activation under heavy braking. If you want more, you'll need this top ultimate trim level, which benefits from an upgraded Intelli Drive 1.0 front camera and radar system that allows an improved level of detection. The forward collision alert system, for instance, gains the ability to pick out cyclists. And three further features are added to the car's repertoire. There's side blind spot alert, which uses ultrasonic rear bumper sensors to detect a vehicle in your blind spot. Lane positioning assist, which helps position you in your lane or follow a vehicle ahead. And rear cross traffic alert, which warns you of approaching vehicles when you're reversing out of a space. An ultimate spec Astra Electric also gets a dose of the latest Stellantis Group self-driving tech, specifically a drive assist 2.0 system that helps with lane changes, controls your speed in bends, and as you approach junctions and roundabouts, recommends speed adaptation in advance. There's also steering wheel hands-off detection to ensure that the driver remains engaged at all times. It's all very reassuring. We gave you the 252 to 260 mile range figure in our driving section, which isn't much affected by body style choice and predictably is virtually the same as this car's Peugeot E308 close cousin. Inevitably, to get near to that kind of reading, you'll have to make frequent use of the provided Eco Drive Mode and of the B transmission setting which will increase the aggressiveness of the brake regeneration system, so recovering more energy back to the 54 kilowatt hour battery, which has 51 kilowatt hours of usable capacity. That battery features a special chemical composition comprising 80% nickel, 10% manganese and 10% cobalt, all of which apparently improves efficiency. As do low friction tyres, aero wheel designs, and supposedly EV orientated aerodynamics. But none of it's enough to get this Vauxhall anywhere near benchmark levels of driving range in this segment. The class leader, Hyundai's Kona Electric, manages 319 miles between charges. We've been getting around 4.3 miles per kilowatt hour on this test, which translates into a real world range of about 220 miles.
You can monitor drive efficiency via a provided statistics part of the center screen's energy section, which gives you a mile per kilowatt hour readout for the last 30, 60 or 180 minutes. That energy section also has an energy flow monitor and a charging section, which you can use to set battery replenishment times if you don't want to use the appropriate part of the provided My Vauxhall app. We mentioned charging, so let's get to that in more detail. Like the E308, the Astra Electric can charge at up to 100 kilowatts. That's about the same as a Hyundai Kona Electric. But to give you some class perspective, an ID3 charges at up to 120 kilowatts. Charging at 100 kilowatts at a DC public rapid charger, the brand claims a battery replenishment rate from 20 to 80% in 26 minutes. An onboard three-phase 11 kilowatt charger is included as standard, and if you're able to charge at 11 kilowatts at home, you'll replenish the battery completely in five hours, 45 minutes. The 7.4 kilowatt wall box you're more likely to have needs eight hours to do the same thing. Plugged into a domestic three pin 2.3 kilowatt socket, you'll need a yawning 26 hours and 25 minutes to fully replenish the car. Via the My Vauxhall smartphone app or by using the vehicle's touchscreen, owners can schedule a wake-up time for the battery. This means that the cells can be at the optimal efficiency temperature from the time you start up. Plus, of course, the interior can also be pre-cooled or preheated as well. What else? Well, as usual with an EV, until 2025, your company car taxation will be rated at a super low 2% and you'll be free of London congestion and ULES charges until that date as well. Garage visits should cost less because there's less to maintain. Service intervals are every year or 20,000 miles and owners can opt to purchase a single service plan to cover all essential maintenance. You'll be given a certificate of battery capacity after each service. The 54 kilowatt hour battery comes with an eight year, 100,000 mile warranty for 70% of its capacity. The main full car warranty is the usual unremarkable three year, 60,000 mile Vauxhall deal, which looks a bit mean compared to what an increasing number of rivals are now offering. Astra Electric Insurance Groups are for some reason a fraction above those of an E308 which is rated at group 24 to 25. All Astra Electrics are rated at group 26. Most who want an EV hatch of this size will choose an SUV or crossover, but if you insist on a more conventional hatch or estate body style, then you might well find this Astra Electric a good pick. Take body shape out of the equation though, and uh, the kind of money Vauxhall wants here, there are an awful lot of other segment EV alternatives you might be better tempted by. The value issues all the more notable because in the last few decades, we've become used to Astra's offering more for your money than rivals. And that might still be the case if you can persuade your local part of the brand's vast UK dealer network to sharpen its pencil with regard to the asking price. If you can't, then the reasons you'll choose this Astra over more obvious competitors like Volkswagen's ID3 or Hyundai's Kona Electric will probably lie in terms of the stylish looks of this L-Series model. It'll certainly make a satisfyingly avant-garde statement outside the school gates or the gym. That styling will, of course, divide opinion, and we're not completely convinced by the quality of some of the cabin materials. Nor are we sure that in the real world, the price premium required for EV power here really adds up on the balance sheet, but that's not an issue exclusive to Vauxhall. If you share that concern, which we'd understand, then like your dealer, we'd point you to the plug-in hybrid version or more likely to the much more affordable hybrid EDCT6 model. Ultimately, of course, the reality is that this is a less radical new electric take on Astra motoring and more merely a differently flavoured Peugeot E308. But there's nothing wrong with that. And as with that Peugeot, what you get here is a refreshing change from all the SUVs and crossovers that usually crowd out this segment. With this car, Vauxhall's seeking the sweet spot between volume and profit. And that's unlikely to lie with the kind of sales leadership we'd once have expected an Astra to have. 
But this is a different kind of Astra from a different kind of Vauxhall mark with a very different future ahead of it.